You're listening to Discovery, a podcast presented by the University of Washington School of Law. Welcome to Discovery, an all-new podcast presented by the University of Washington School of Law. I'm your host, John Blumster, and today we're speaking with Flint Taylor, founding partner of the People's Law Office in Chicago and author of a new book, The Torture Papers, Racism and Police Violence in Chicago. He played a central role in the events of the book, which explores the 1969 murders of the Black Panther Party chairman, Fred Hampton, the ensuing litigation, and Taylor's decades-long pursuit of John Burge, who was the leader of an infamous torture ring within the CPD. Flint, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Happy to be here. So what inspired you to write a book focusing on these events right now? Well, now it's, what, 50 years since I started doing this as a law student, and For the last three years, I've been writing this book to try to chronicle what uh, I had learned and different struggles we'd been through to obtain various court decisions and exposing the torture and and the assassination of Fred Hampton, as well as the torture of uh, over 125 African-American men in the city of Chicago over a 20-year period. So it seemed to me and and to others that I knew uh, that it would be good to get this down into a book from a personal point of view, but yet maybe uh, maybe look at it as a um, historical memoir uh, that I tried to be as true to the, the record as I could, and, and I based it primarily on court transcripts and newspaper reports and that kind of thing uh, rather than, you know, interviews, because I felt that what the men who had been tortured, what they said then, what they testified about, that was the most accurate voice that I could give to them, and uh, I felt it important to give voice to the... the uh, survivors of police torture and uh, the people who also survived from uh, the murderous raid on Fred Hampton's apartment. So this book drops the reader right into the middle of the civil rights movement in Chicago where the Black Panther Party has become a political force and its chairman, Fred Hampton, is the target of an FBI investigation. So who was Fred Hampton and why was he on the FBI's radar? Well, Fred Hampton was a 21-year-old uh, young man. He was the chairman of the Chicago of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party back in 1969, uh, and he was targeted because he was a charismatic leader. Uh, he was someone who the FBI had decided needed to be neutralized in their own terminology. The FBI had been not only investigating, but they had created an illegal and unconstitutional program called the COINTEL program. And this was under uh, J. Edgar Hoover, the notorious uh, FBI director for decades. And he was uh, devoted to and focused on in his own terminology, neutralizing and ultimately destroying black nationalist and black liberation organizations. So when the Panthers uh, became a real viable force in the community and uh, were raising real important issues, then they became a target. And among the Panther leaders, Fred Hampton was perhaps the most uh, charismatic young leader and the FBI took notice. And so that is why he was targeted. So what led up to and then what happened on the morning of December 4th, 1969? Well, now I'm bringing together uh, an investigation and uh, litigation uh, that took some 13 years. Uh, But during that 13-year period, we were able to uncover that this raid, now we're talking about a police raid at at a Uh, West Side apartment where uh, nine Panthers were sleeping at 4.30 in the morning, including Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, two of the leaders. The police went there with machine guns and shotguns and other uh, weapons, and they uh, burst in the front and the back door. They fired over 90 bullets, bullets into this little apartment, and they killed Hampton and Clark. And they wounded several of the other survivors. Uh, Not satisfied with that, they then charged the survivors with attempted murder, even though the ballistics evidence would ultimately show that only one shot at most was fired by the Panthers and over 90 were fired by the police. As we uh, got deeper into the case, we found out uh, that this wasn't just a raid that was executed by the police. 
Chicago police, uh, under the leadership of the state's attorney, uh, Edward Hanrahan, the, uh, the DA in, in Chicago, in Cook County, uh, but also was masterminded uh, by the FBI and this COINTELPRO program that I mentioned earlier, and that they was an FBI informant by the name of William O'Neill, uh, who was uh, in the Black Panther Party and who had drawn a floor plan of the apartment that I mentioned where the raid took place. And in on that floor plan, he marked the bed where Hampton and, and uh, his fiancée, Deborah Johnson, would be sleeping. And this floor plan was supplied as part of the counterintelligence program to the state's attorney and to the police uh, in order to orchestrate this raid. And, you know, following the raid, a lot of the questions that came out of it, many claim that this was really what could be qualified as an assassination. Does this, was this an accurate claim? I think so. Yes. I think uh, my, one of my partners, Jeff Haas, who was, he and I tried the um, case, the civil rights case for 18 months in, in the mid seventies. He's written a book called The Assassination of Fred Hampton. And, uh, Hampton was shot in the head while he was sleeping. Um, the FBI took credit for the raid afterwards, gave a bonus to the uh, uh, informant that I mentioned who set up the raid, uh, called the raid a success. And given the fact that assassinations carries a different connotation, of course, than murder. Uh, we always talked about it as murder, but as we learn more and more about the FBI being behind it and having a program, then it became he was targeted not only because he was a Black Panther, but he specifically was targeted because of who he was, like Martin Luther King was assassinated, like Malcolm X was assassinated, well, Fred Hampton was assassinated as well. So you were one of the prosecuting attorneys in Hampton v. Hanrahan. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that case unfolded over those 18 months? Well, we brought the case in 1970, uh, um, about six months after the raid. Uh, there was like six years of pretrial litigation. There was an appeal. Uh, we fought very hard to get some of the documents that I just mentioned, including that floor plan. And then in 1976, it went to trial. And it went to trial, as you mentioned, for 18 months, the longest trial at that time in federal court history. During the trial, we were able to uh, expose the fact that the FBI had, had uh, suppressed 200 volumes of FBI documents, um, some of which were very pertinent to the case. Uh, and uh, But we also had a judge who was very much uh, dead set against our succeeding. So after 18, 18 months of trial and all the evidence that we were able to uncover, the judge decided uh, not to let the jury decide the case. And so he threw the case out after 18 months. This led to an appeal to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and we won that appeal. We then uh, had to defend that uh, victory in the U.S. Supreme Court. We were successful in doing that. So then it came back to another judge in, in Chicago. It would have been 10 years, 11 years after we first filed the case. And we were able then, because of what the, uh, the, the, the higher courts had said about our evidence, to obtain a settlement for the families of, of Hampton and Clark and the survivors, which at that time was the largest civil rights settlement in the history of, of the United States as, as, uh, as far as we knew. So 13 years of, of litigation. Uh, both my partner, Jeff Haas, and I ended up in jail for a moment, uh, being held in contempt. But ultimately, we were able to to obtain some, some vindication, uh, and not only in court, but being able to get all of this evidence out into the public light and to change the narrative of, of the case from a shootout that was, of course, a false narrative to a shoot-in, to a murder, and then ultimately to an assassination. And I think Jeff's book, Jeff Haas's book, helps to cement the idea that, in fact, it was an officially sponsored assassination of a, 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 of a vibrant young African-American leader in the city of Chicago.
the other huge topic in this book is John Burge and your epic saga that spans 30 years. Yes. Um, so who is John Burge and how did you first hear about him and what he was up to in the CPD? John Burge grew up on the southeast side of Chicago in a changing neighborhood, went to Vietnam as a military police sergeant, and while on a POW camp in Vietnam, he witnessed uh, and may have participated in the torture of uh, Vietnamese civilians and, and prisoners of war. Uh, that torture included using electric shock uh, with uh, various devices, uh, including one that, that is pictured on the front of my book, uh, which we call the torture machine. And when he came back from Vietnam, he became a Chicago police officer. He quickly rose through the ranks from detective to sergeant to uh, lieutenant to commander. And during that period of time, he orchestrated and commanded a group of Chicago police detectives uh, who tortured African-American suspects who were uh, picked up on the south side of Chicago and later on the west side of Chicago. And they were picked up in serious cases, and they used the kinds of tactics, that being Burge and his men, that included electric shock, uh, that included putting uh, bags and plastic uh, typewriter covers over people's heads in order to cut off their breathing, in order to make them think they were being suffocated, uh, mock executions by putting pistols and rifles uh, and shotguns in people's mouths and pulling the trigger, making them think that they were being executed, and uh, beatings, particularly on the genitals and other parts of the body. And so that um, we first came to know about Burge in a very celebrated case uh, where two African-American young men were arrested for killing two white cops. And they were brutally, brutally tortured. Uh, and this kind of opened the door to us ultimately representing one of those two men uh, in a case in federal court, alleging that his human and, and constitutional rights had been violated by the torture. And then later, uh, 30 years later, we ended up representing the second man, Jackie Wilson. So how did, how did you first start to find cracks in the, in the cover-up? How, how did this saga unfold over those three decades? Well, Andrew Wilson was tortured in 1982. But because he was charged with uh, death penalty crimes, uh, no one particularly cared, certainly in the uh, administration of justice, cared about that. Uh, they, they, they wanted to send him to uh, the death penalty as fast as they could. So even though that evidence came out of his torture at that time, it wasn't known that it was a pattern and practice of torture. And what's interesting and part of the reasons that my book is called The Torture Machine is not only because of the box, the torture machine box. But because in Chicago, we had a democratic machine. We had a machine, uh, the daily machine, political machine. So the this couldn't have gone on for 20 years without the highest levels of uh, county and city government, police department officials uh, condoning it and participating in some level. And so when when this first became known, the state's attorney the chief prosecutor of Cook County was Richard Daly, and that's uh, who went on to be the mayor. And he made a decision at that time not to investigate the torture and not to bring to justice Burge and his men. And because of that, the torture scandal went on for another 10 years. During that time, we were involved in representing Wilson, as I mentioned, in a civil case. And... Uh, in 1989, we started to get letters from an anonymous police source who was telling us that, hey, this isn't just an isolated incident, that this is part of a whole pattern and practice of torture under Burge, uh, that he's a racist, that Daly uh, knew about this, that other high-level officials knew about all of this and did nothing. In other words, these, uh, this anonymous source, whom we later uh, uh, dubbed Deep Badge, uh, <laughs> like a deep throat in Watergate, that he um, laid out a, a roadmap to us to understand that this wasn't just 
one outrageous case of police brutality and violence, but was part of a pattern and practice. And so he gave us enough information, or she, we, don't, we never knew who the, the person was, uh, to, to investigate, find other uh, survivors of torture who told similar stories and they were documented, uh, and led us on this path of, of decades of investigating, which led us to uh, many other cases and led us to uh, finding out Daly's role in it and also uh, helping to uh, get certain people off of death row who had been tortured into giving false confessions. Uh, and ultimately, Burge was fired based on the evidence that came out. And then 15 years later, he was prosecuted for obstruction of justice and did four years in the penitentiary. Did you ever feel at risk personally with so many of these high-level organizations involved? Well, on a certain level, we, we did. Uh, we certainly received some threats, and we had heard we received some threats uh, during the Hampton case, and we received some threats, including one specific uh, threat that was uh, communicated to us that Burge himself had made a threat to 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 blow us away as was the uh, with a shotgun if he in fact was prosecuted or fired. That didn't happen. I mean, he he did get <laughs> prosecuted and ultimate he fired and ultimately prosecuted, but he didn't blow us away. <laughs> luckily for us. But yes, um, I don't know how serious the threats were. Uh, they were never uh, actually implemented. But uh, yes, when you're taking on uh, the political machine, you're taking on the police department, you're taking on people who are very violent individuals, that being police officers who torture and assassinate, you, you have to uh, be very uh, mindful of the fact that uh, you, you might be in some danger. Although in this country, unlike in lots of other countries, lawyers haven't been uh, targets of assassinations, at least yet. So from 1969 till now, all of your work, what do you feel is the, the lasting legacy ultimately of, of these cases and all this litigation? And what do you really want readers to take away from this book? Well, you asked me why I was motivated to write the book. And I think that it was a continuation of, of the work that we do as lawyers, as, as people's lawyers. I think we're very much committed to the idea that we're not just lawyers in court, but we're also uh, responsible. We have the responsibility for educating people because we're learning about things that are really significant. And what we're trying to do as we uncover this evidence is to bring a true people's narrative, so to speak, of the events. As I said, in these cases is obviously a very, very uh, powerful attempt by power structure uh, and to some degree the media to gloss over, cover up, put out a narrative that's not true, that's false. And so when you uncover the true narrative, then you feel a responsibility to put that narrative out. And so what I hope that people will take away from the book are several things. And one is to understand the, 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 the actual narrative of what happened in the assassination of Fred Hampton and uh, the torture struggle. To give voice, to understand the humanity and what uh, the, the survivors or the victims of police torture went through was another important thing that I was trying to demonstrate as well. So that's some of the uh, why I did the book and, 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 and why um, I hope people will use it in, in, in terms of education, in terms of people learning, in fact, how far government entities, police will go, and also to get the feel um, that you can fight for justice, you can fight against systemic racial uh, police violence, and that it's important that people do so. And I try to bring across the idea that, you know, the community organizations, of organizations that span the 50 year period in one form or another, right up to today with the movement for black lives and all the other 
uh, organizations that helped to get us reparations in the city of Chicago for the survivors of police torture. So those are some of the things that, that I hope people will take away from the book and, and learn from the book. Flint Taylor is a founding partner of the People's Law Office in Chicago and author of the new book, The Torture Machine, Racism and Police Violence in Chicago. Flint, thank you again for joining us here on Discovery. You're very welcome. Discovery is hosted by John Blumster and produced by Greg Olson. Additional voiceover work by Ben Gonio with original music by John Blumster. Discovery is recorded in William H. Gates Hall at the University of Washington School of Law in Seattle with the support of Mario L. Barnes, the Tony Rempe Dean. For more, visit law.uw.edu.